No, I'm not saying it's a bad song. All I'm saying is that you could get a broom or something like that, you know, and dip it in some brake fluid and put the other end up my arse and stick me on a trampoline in a moving elevator and I would write a better song on the walls. That's all I'm saying. This, in this bar, where I heard that song, there was a very nice young uh, bar lady there, very nicely spoken a young woman with all the facial jewellery and everything, all the stair rods and knuckle dusters and nails of Christ and everything. And she bent over to get my order. I saw her thong. I didn't want to see it. Who is this garment for? Who, it can't be for the wearer. People just look at you and think you're economizing too much. Here's two dollars. Get a pair of underwear, please. <laughs> Is it supposed to be for other people's delectation? Because all I could think was, you, you're going to forget my order. You're going to forget my, you, you're going to forget my order. You're being anally assaulted. You're going to forget my order. <laughs> I'm looking forward to being properly old. You know, really old. I have a great age so I can be with my son or daughter in a restaurant and lean over every now and again and say, you know what I just did? I just pissed myself. <laughs> you deal with it. I'm very jealous of my parents, you know. It's a difficult relationship, parents and children, always, you know. It never gets any easier. They ring you up, you know, allegedly to find out how you are. It's never to find out how you are, it's to find out how they did. The guilt is incredible, the power they can wield, you know, and they play it very heavily on the phone when they call you up, you know. Is there only a poor old mother here now ringing up to find out how you are, so I do be crucified from the terrible cold winds which do blow off the phone when you're not calling, which is all the time. <laughs> oh, God. Don't mind that sound in the background now. It's only me shocking on the odd piece of gravel to have something to do in between now and when I die. And you think, okay, well, look, why don't you come over and, you know, come and see us and everything. Say, oh, no, don't, don't tempt me. I couldn't do that. Sure, I'd explode with joy. <laughs> come over. You can stay in the spare room. It'll be great. We'll go out. No, no, put me in the ditch. The ditch. That's where I belong. That's where you've left me anyway. <laughs> stay tuned. Dylan Moran will be back after this. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. You want to go out sometime? Uh, thank you, but I'm straight, actually, so... That's okay. I only date straight guys. <laughs> Love, in all its forms, is very difficult, you know? Um, to express, to, to feel. I mean, it's, it changes, obviously, when it's not like, you know, if you're young and you're romantically in love with somebody, often if you're young or if you've just met somebody, it's crazy, you know, or completely overwhelming, you can't think about anything else, you just want to climb inside the other person and live under their pancreas. Um, <laughs> and then it mellows somewhat, <laughs> to the point where you can barely look at them. That's your thing. Without feeling a mild distaste. But the... Or at least to the point where people wake up beside one another and instead of giving each other all their best lines and trying to impress each other and show off and elicit the best from each other, you know, the courtship kind of finds its own level and people just wake up beside one another and say, I have this, are you interested? We have about 1.18 seconds before the children wake up. There it is. What do you want to do? Do you want to go for it or what? <laughs> Which you cannot really overestimate just how infantile men are about sex. You are talking about people who have sex because they have a headache, you know, or have been shot or are on fire. It's not, it's regarded as a universal cure. And, and you feel a certain envy 
again for women, you know, for their bodies. They're obviously so, they're so much better to look at. And obviously when they were being designed, it was a good afternoon. Everybody was having a nice time, you know, they were, they were enjoying themselves, saying there was lots of nice food and rosé around, and all, all the designers were into it, going, moto, moto, car. there we go, funny stuff, secret thing, drinks holder, get them out, there they go, they're ready. <laughs> And when men were up for production, it was some kind of treble late shift in Skrivonkia on a Friday night where they'd run out of all the good concrete, so they just made stick men, stick men. Oh, they've got no genitals. Bring them back. We'll use some of the elbow scrag left over from the women. Here we go. Pum, 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 pum. And that's why male genitalia is so very horrible to look at. You know, this kind of bagpipes covered in hair. It's really not very good. Or some sort of deep sea fish that lived for about 18 minutes. It's horrible. Which is why it's so very dispiriting to touch yourself if you're a man. You know, you, they say that there's a kind of melancholia that descends on people uh, if they make love, the petty more, the little death. Well, there's a very similar uh, sensation if, if you had a romantic night in with yourself. Because you get a very vivid feeling of failed suicide, really. And I think a lot of that is because of the quality of the gear you've got to work with, you know? I mean, if it was something nice down there to look at, something cheery, you know, I, I don't know what, I, I don't know, a, a kitten's head, something, something. <laughs> you could just tickle its chin until it got sick, you know, something. <laughs> I mean, I think, I'm not going to make any generalizations or anything, because it's vulgar, you know, I'm not going to do that, but... <laughs> no, really, because it's kind of retarded, but they... Women don't have any feelings, though, because the... <laughs> I always think it's men who are far more romantic. You know, it's men who you'll hear say, I have found somebody, she is amazing, she has completely changed my life, I don't know what I would do without this person. It's incredible. And it's an amazing feeling. I, if, if she were to go, I don't know what would happen to me, I would end up an alcoholic in some horrible flat somewhere with a one-ring stove and a cat that was always dying and itchy trousers. I, don't, I wouldn't be able to live. That's how women feel about shoes. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and yet men are constantly envious of women, in particular envious of the radar, the sensitivity they have in conversation. You know, because a woman will say to you, well, I'm going to go and see a friend, I'll be back in a little while. And you, and you say, well, how was so-and-so? Say, oh, it's not good, it's not good. She's got early onset diabetes. She's having an affair. It's always very tricky, you know. And there's a very good chance she'll lose her job, really. So, you know. And you think that's incredible. You were there for 10 minutes. She told you all this. You, you can talk so effectively to one another that you found all that. No, no, no. She didn't say anything, you know. She, but she didn't finish her tea. <laughs> and it's not like that with men. You know, the rule in male conversation is that it's your turn to talk when the other guy has the drink up to his face. <laughs> he takes it away and you're on again, you know. Neither of you can listen to one another, obviously, because you're both drinking and the fluid fills up your head. And that's why men have known one another for 20 or 30 years will go home to their wives or girlfriends. He'll say, well, how was so-and-so? And he'll say, I don't know. What the fuck? the fuck would I know? <laughs> we were together for eight hours. I know, we just had a drink. Shut up. Women are a lot better at arguing. You know, I saw a row today on the street and I felt sorry for the guy, you know, because she, the woman used this line on him. She did this great line. She said, I need more space. Now, whenever anybody says that to you, they never say exactly how much space they need. But strangely enough, it always seems to be the exact same height, depth and breadth as you. <laughs> And the guy was devastated, you know? She did this great thing, she threw shopping bags at his feet and went off hailing a taxi that wasn't quite there yet. <laughs> Leaving him there going... <laughs> Women that believe in dignity, I think, afterwards. They'll carry on with their appointments, they'll meet their friends, they'll say, Yes, we broke up, I'm absolutely fine, I don't want to talk about it. A small glass of white wine for me, thank you very much. I'm absolutely fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you? Let's talk about you. I want to talk about you. How are you? How are the children? Tell me about the children and your husband who lives in the house with you. <laughs> Men are gutted, eviscerated completely by argument. They can't cope. You find these guys alone at home after they've been dumped. You have to be very gentle with them. You can't come in and say, come on, stop watching cable. Get, put some 
pants on, stop sitting there in your underwear watching television, drinking. Come on, come out. You can't do that. They need you to be very slow with them. You have to be just gentle and say, how would it be, how would it be if we took some of the French fries out of your hair? <laughs> some of them. Just some. Get them dry, cleaned, maybe we can have them for dinner. Whatever, but could I show you a photograph of a bath? Would that be okay? Would that be all right? BBC America Comedy Live. We'll be back with more Dylan Moran after this. America. All right, all right, you want to go where? You want to go 4,000 and 9th, all right? That's pretty easy. You go all the way up 8th, okay? Take it all the way up. Then get a cab right back here, okay? Now, you see the pharmacy across over there, across the street? You see it right there? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, well, just ignore that, okay? Take a bus from here to the subway. You want to get the A17BQ, all right? And you get on the downtown train. You take it all the way to the midtown on the uptown side. When you come out at the Hudson, okay, you got to cross it, but don't take the bridge because it's kind of dirty, you know? Get in the water. Get in the water. Hold your ears, though, because it's not very good for sinus. When you get to the other side, you know, after you want to cross then to Great Neck Plaza, call me from there, okay? Have you got a dollar? I don't do this for free, lady. I don't like politicians, uh, you know, as a group, really. They remind me of the sort of people I used to live with in flats who would leave notes, you know? <laughs> like, we're out of coffee, I hate to bring it up, but it was mine, and it is the second time it's happened. Thanks very much, everybody. Tina. Uh, or... Or please remember to leave the bins out in the bin leaving out area, which is marked bins, actually. Thanks, <laughs> Tina. I used to end up leaving the odd note for Tina myself, you know, like, uh, Dear Tina, everybody hates you. <laughs> yeah, I suppose if I'm anything, I'm probably liberal, you know, because I tend to be scared of everybody. I found this out a couple of years ago. I was in a bar in London, and uh, I was feeling...